Gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Well, good evening, all. Uh, I'm Arthur Solzberger, Jr., chairman of the board of the New York Times Company. For, um, thank you. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds in the fields of theater and film, music, art, literature, social justice, and politics. But tonight, we have a special treat. We're pairing two of our brightest editors with one of the most accomplished First Amendment lawyers in the country. And yes, he's one of ours too. <laughs> and a bonus, all three of them are great, great fun. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's conversation, which I expect will be a wide-ranging one on press freedom in this very troubling time with the focus on David McCraw's recently published book, Truth in Our Times, Inside the Fight for Press Freedom in This Age of Alternative Facts. David is the Times' Deputy General Counsel, but he's better known around our building as the newsroom's lawyer, whose goal is to help the Times publish the truth and stay out of trouble. <laughs> but our journalists seem as even more, something more. As our executive editor, Dean Baquet, has said, he's part of our tribe, and he would be part of it even if he wasn't a better writer than most of us. <laughs> At a moment when press freedom is under attack, David has emerged as one of our most effective protectors. He is not so much a lawyer who works in journalism as a journalist who works in law. He has one of the finest journalistic minds and sharpest editing pens in the business. You see it in everything he does, from his legal filings to a certain viral letter to a lawyer for President Trump. <laughs> Dean will join David tonight in what I'm sure will be a grilling by Carolyn Ryan, a Times' assistant editor and former Washington bureau chief and political director. Before I bring them to the stage, let me leave you with a, a quote from the Times' review of David's book, penned by another lawyer-turned-writer, Preet Bharara. Truth in our times is not dire. It is spirited and hopeful and even, at times, lighthearted. It is, in a way, a love letter to the First Amendment. McCraw captures the mood best in one early sentence. Quote, it was a hell of a time to be a lawyer for the New York Times, end quote. It sure was and is. So I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, at this, particularly at this critical time in our history, one where the basic idea of a free press is being challenged daily. We're grateful, all of us at the New York Times are grateful for your support of our mission to seek the truth and to help people understand the world. Now, please join me in welcoming, welcoming David McCraw, Dean Baquet, and Carolyn Ryan. to start by saying welcome uh, both to you here in the Times Center but also to our online audience. Uh, David and Dean are colleagues who I have huge uh, respect and admiration for and I've seen them during really stressful moments guide us through tough decisions toward powerful journalism that has really changed the world. But that won't stop me from asking impertinent questions. <laughs> uh, I do have to interject. It might be uh, difficult for some of you to understand what a newsroom lawyer does or what a powerful presence David is in the lives of our journalists. So I'll just tell you this. This afternoon when I was getting ready to come over here, 
I got a call from a reporter who's down in the south in one of those, I shouldn't name it, but one of those southern towns where there's one big employer and everybody in town does not want to get on the bad side of that employer. And the reporter was trying to get some employees to talk about wrongdoing going on in the plant there. And there was one employee who was willing to talk. And of course, this employee got a lawyer, a little like mom and pop lawyer. And this lawyer was terrified of the employee speaking to the New York Times. So the report, reporter said, you should know our lawyer is a badass. <laughs> His name is David <clears throat> McCraw. Google him. <laughs> and they did. And the reporter said after that, it was like a sedative. Like, everybody got calm. <laughs> and then suddenly, like good Southerners, they all started talking. So look for that story. Uh, so I don't need to do anything. This is great. <laughs> we just invoked That's your name. That's my job. I just, yeah. uh, so I, I, I do want to start, just to let you know, I'm, I'll be asking Dean <clears throat> and David questions for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we're going to turn to what will be the best part of the evening, your questions. So um, and keep in mind, uh, the book, which is wonderful, uh, is for sale uh, after the event out in the lobby. David will be there, and he'll be signing copies. Uh, so I want to jump right in uh, and talk, uh, sort of jumping off what Arthur said. Obviously, uh, when we examine President Trump in his rhetoric in an era when journalists are under attack, he's called the press the enemy of the people. He's, he's coined the phrase or uh, popularized the phrase fake news. He often contests both fact-based stories and I would say fact-based reality. Um, so, I think it's been well established that Trump has fomented hostility toward the press. But my question to you is, why did it seem like so many people in the country were receptive to that message? Why did that resonate with people? Why did that message work? I, I think the press has a, um, I, I should say something about President Trump's rhetoric. I think it's deeply damaging. Um, and, I, and, I, and I fear, and we can talk about this later, it will have long lasting impact on, on the press and how people regard the press. <clears throat> the part that is our fault, if you go back years, I think when we had advertising as the, as the foundation of the economics of newspapers, I think we were a little arrogant and distant from readers. Um, I think we didn't connect to readers as well as we could have. Um, and I think the perception in, among a lot of people who read American newspapers, the New York Times included, is that we, we didn't think or care about them enough. We were not transparent. We were mysterious. When I was the editor of the Los Angeles Times, um, before I came back to work at the New York Times, we did a survey of our readers. And it broke my heart to see that readers thought, when we, it was at the height of the war in Afghanistan, that readers thought when there was a Kabul dateline, that it meant the reporter made a bunch of phone calls to Kabul. It broke my heart, because I had reporters risking their lives in Kabul. I don't think we're, we were transparent. I don't think we were open. And I think it made us susceptible to somebody coming in and saying bad things about us. And I don't think we quite knew how to react. But I, but I think we were distant from our readers. And I think the good news now is because we're more dependent on our readers. And, and I think we've, we've been humbled a little bit over the last five or six years before Trump. And I think we understand we have to connect our readers. David, you're from the middle of the country. Uh, what, do you agree with uh, what Dean had to say there? Uh, I'm supposed to advocate for the papers. He, he, can, he, can blame our, he can blame us all he wants. I'm going to blame them, OK? <laughs> no, you know, it, 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 part of it, it's, it's easy. You know, it's an easy hit. That, that I, I spoke a couple of years ago at a, at a big dinner for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. And I talked about how the survey showed that that uh, the, the press was, uh, was less trusted, less liked than it ever been in, in years and years and years. And, and I always thought that was a little dishonest because if you ask somebody, what do you think about the mass media, if you are a self-respecting, freedom-loving American, you say exactly what my son used to say about school in, in junior high. It sucks. You know, that's, that's just the only acceptable answer, right? But when you actually look how people operate, they believe, they read, they actually act upon right. on it. I think part of it, too, is that I was fortunate that when I was growing up, when I was going to college, 
it was a time when there were these successes by the press. So the coverage of the civil rights movement, the coverage of Vietnam, the coverage of Watergate, all of that made you as an American happy, proud, and thankful that you had a free press. Right. And I remember as, as a high school kid going, sneaking into the University of Illinois Journalism School to hear Peter Arnett speak, the great AP war correspondent, and just thinking like, that is an amazing job that guy has, right? Telling the truth about what's going on in Vietnam. And it's been a while <laughs> since we've had that kind of success, we've had that kind of of, of uh, triumph in covering a story that, that resonates across the political spectrum. Well, I want to turn to one of those uh, recent successes. Um, one of the reasons I love this book, by the way, David, is it's not just kind of a, a lofty thesis uh, or uh, about the First Amendment and the free press. What it really is is real life stories about the First Amendment in action inside the New York Times. And I want to get into one of those stories uh, that starts, as most stories do, with Dean Baquet uh, on the third floor uh -oh. in a story meeting. <laughs> and this is during the campaign of 2016 in the spring. And Dean uh, is kind of instructing us what storylines, offering ideas on what to follow. And he decides, the reporters have heard rumblings and rumors and tips about Donald Trump's treatment of women. And Dean says, I want a big story examining how Donald Trump treats women. What were you imagining that we might get? <clears throat> um, as I recall, and you were in these discussions too, as I recall, we, heard, we had enough tips, and we knew about his, sort of his, his reputation and his boasts in the New York tabloids, that I, my, I, have a, I have a philosophy which is report very, very, very aggressively. You can always um, produce stories that are more conservative than your reporting. It's report aggressively um, and then publish with some discretion. So I instructed the reporters to report aggressively to find out if, in fact, there were lots of women who were willing to talk about how Trump had treated them. And in fact, there were tons of women who were willing to talk about it, so including many women, many, many women on the record. And I thought, I just thought that was a very powerful story about about. Trump, and, and I think a prescient story, because it was before the famous um, Access Hollywood. Essex Hollywood tape came out. Yes. This is, um, many of you remember this story, but um, we run a 2,500-word story by <coughs> Megan Tui and Michael Barbaro detailing all these unwanted advances uh, by Trump uh, toward women. And then the Access Hollywood tape comes out, uh, during which Trump is bragging about, well, you remember it. Uh, so, given that there's a tape, Trump does something that he never <coughs> usually does, which is to apologize. And then, shortly thereafter, he has a debate with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton uh, is, is pretty aggressive, and Donald Trump says, well, I'm really sorry about that language, but you need to understand, I've never actually done that to a woman. I've never made those kind of advances. It was locker room talk. You remember this. So, he says during the debate he's never done it. Lo and behold, two women here, you probably remember one of them from Manhattan, a 72-year-old, tells, tells the New York Times that, in fact, he groped her on an airplane. Right. Um, and so we, of course, uh, run the story uh, about these two women saying, in fact, he did do this. And um, Trump calls it fiction. Uh, his lawyer threatens to sue us. And then you do something, uh, oh, and they call for an immediate retraction. They call for us to take the story off the website and to apologize. And then it goes, it lands in your lap. That's right. So <laughs> the, the story had, had, had run the day before. And I had read it on the subway. Uh, and it was on my way someplace. And I thought it was a great story. I thought it did what journalism was supposed to do, which is it told a story that was credible. But at the same time, it gave every possible building block to somebody who wanted to raise questions about it. Why hadn't the women spoken up sooner? Who had they spoken <clears throat> to? Why is this coming out now and all that? And uh, our reporters had, had spoken to Donald Trump and the campaign said, you know, if you run that, we're going we're gonna to sue you. And then after we ran it, they renewed that. And we were waiting the night before 
because we kept hearing these reports that this that this letter was coming from from the Trump campaign, from Trump's attorneys, uh, and our PR people were calling me. You know, be sure and tell us if you hear anything, anything. And and you know, by now it was like <clears throat> eight or nine o'clock at night. And unless they were going to, and I knew they had to file in court before they could sue us. So if they were really going to sue us, they were going to have to go to Bronx Criminal Court or something and get in line with all the arraignments, <coughs> uh, but which seemed a little unlikely. But I woke up the next morning and there was an it was an email from Dean which had the heading after midnight, uh, and there was the letter that that had had said that we should retract the story. I, I wrote uh, fairly quickly um, I, the the letter which uh, many of you are familiar with that we put out. Uh, it is on the back of the book as well if if you missed it. Um, and which, <laughs> which will be for sale right, right, for right sale, outside. Right, right, right. The right, right, back right. of the book will be included. Right, the back of the book is included. <laughs> At no extra I, charge. You have to buy it to read the back of the book, though. Um, and, uh, you know, people said, was, was that out of character? And there was a certain amount of criticism I got from journalists elsewhere, not here, about <coughs> whether it was too aggressive or, or not. And it was much more pointed than what I would usually write. Mostly when people write to me, they have a legitimate good faith grief with us about something. I want to hear them out. I want to know what they thought we got wrong. <coughs> figure out whether that happened. If there's a correction that's needed, we're going to do that. But when it's Donald Trump or it's Harvey Weinstein or it's the National Football League, it is much more of a political <laughs> statement than anything. And they're releasing it publicly and they're trying to, to politicize the moment. They're not really looking for a correction or retraction. And I usually feel that we should respond in kind. Um, I just want to quote uh, for those of you who might have forgotten this letter, which is uh, legendary now uh, in the New York Times newsroom. The case that you're essentially making is that we couldn't defame <coughs> Donald Trump's character given that he had bragged about certain things that he had already done. <clears throat> he has bragged about intruding on beauty pageant contestants in, the, in their dressing rooms. He acquiesced to a radio host's request to discuss Mr. Trump's own daughter as a, a quote, piece of ass. Now, when you were in law school, were you imagining that this was the kind of letter? I took a class in that, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's actually, somebody, somebody wrote a, a legal text about legal writing and, and said that it was the, the only time that he'd ever remembered that, that the term uh, actual malice and piece of ass appeared in the same bit of legal, <laughs> legal writing. And I've never checked the facts on that. Yeah. So I want to pan out a little bit and ask you both um, uh, about something that is kind of fascinating to me, uh, fascinating to observe, which <clears throat> is Donald Trump's relationship with The New York Times. Um, why does he seem so fixated on us? And what, what is sort of driving that in your view? Uh, so this, this is a little bit of um, pop psychology. <clears throat> I mean, he grew up in New York. Um, I think he's a guy, if you, if you read what we and others have written about him, his father made a tremendous fortune outside of Manhattan. <clears throat> and I think it was a big deal for Donald Trump to come to New York and conquer New York, to build tall buildings in New York, to live as he did as a young man when he moved here, the sort of the New York limousine, <clears throat> dating models, Manhattan cliched um, life. And I think part of, of that, that acceptance by the power structure and the powers that be in New York was to be accepted by the New York Times. Not, you know, the New York Post, where he was a regular figure, but I think it was to be accepted by the New York Times. And, and by the way, we wrote some stories 20, 30, 40 years when he first arrived in New York that I bet we, I look back at and wince, not me, but stories about this handsome, dashing guy who shows up and who had so much money. And I think I, we, we now know that that wasn't true. I believe <clears throat> the first time he appeared on the front page, we likened him to Robert Redford, but slightly better looking. Yeah. <laughs> he, was the, he was this dashing. So if you're, if, you're in, if you're in the shoes of someone who wants to be accepted by the ultimate New York establishment institution, whether we, whether we are that or not, we can debate, but I think that's how he saw us. <clears throat> and then he becomes president, and he learns what all presidents learn, and not just Donald Trump. I mean, there's a famous story where Bill Clinton goes to <clears throat> the editorial board of the New York Times because they're beating him up, 
and Bill Clinton says, what, what are you guys doing? I thought I was like, um, I thought I was the kind of guy you wanted. And the, and I guess it was Howell Raines at the time said, and, no, and, and Howell Raines said, well, we're just showing you tough love. And Clinton's reaction was, I get the tough part. When's the love coming? <laughs> <clears throat> I, think, I think Trump like, is figuring, oh my god, I'm the president of the United States. And now these guys, in his mind, are, are banging away at me. I don't think of it that way. I think of it as covering him aggressively. But we're, they're ban and they won't give me my due. And I think that that makes him crazy. And he, when he has come to the Times, <clears throat> and when he has talked to me, and when he's talked to others at the paper, he talks about how he sees the New York Times. And I think, I think it just makes him, it, it must make him nuts. I will say all presidents have that reaction when they first make it to the White House and they see what the job of the press is. And he, remember, this is a guy, besides the, the, the little bit of pop psychology, um, I think informed, the pop psychology I offered, this is a guy whose world was the New York, the world of the New York tabloids where you know, you, his exploits were very, very different. And he was written about as you know, the guy who you know, had, was dashing, you know, the, the serial marriages, the whole thing. And suddenly, he's being grilled about his health care policy. Right, right. And I think, that was, I think he, it's just jarring for him. Yeah. You know, and, and I detail <clears throat> in the book kind of the history of, of my relationship with his lawyers, because before he was President Trump, he, when he was just real estate developer Trump, he was obsessed with this idea that he be the biggest real estate developer in New York. And I spent hours on the phone with his attorneys debating this. We ran a story that suggested that he wasn't. The lawyer calls me and says he is. He is the biggest real estate developer in New York. And so I said, you know, let's, we don't need to have this argument. Just send me the facts. And so Guy sends over the list of properties, and I start looking at them, and they include places that are in uh, West Palm Beach, and you know, this <laughs> 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 Right, 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 and so forth. And I said, well, you know, that's not in New York. And then we get into that you have to be a lawyer to love conversation about, well, is he the biggest developer in New York of buildings everywhere, or the biggest developer in New York, and what do we mean? But. Uh, but we then get to that point where the, the lawyer gives me some really important legal advice, which is his hair is fair game. You can say, <laughs> you, I will never, ever call you about anything you say about the hair. I, will, I just, one thing I want to I, I wanna say, because it's so, <clears throat> you know, le lest we get too much into yeah. Trump, all presidents, and as a reporter, and as an editor, and as the former Washington bureau chief of the of the New York Times, we had a very tense relationship with the Obama administration. In fact, the whole I ran the Washington Bureau through much of Obama's presidency. Right. The entire time I ran the New York Times' coverage of Barack Obama, I never met him. Because I didn't want to go to the White House to socialize. I don't think, that, I don't think that's my role. I wouldn't go to off-the-record dinners. They would invite um, you know, ranking journalists off the record dinners. I didn't believe in doing that. <clears throat> we had, the, it, it's, it's easy for people to forget. We were, we were covering very hard stories about the increasing dramatic use of drones to conduct warfare in Pakistan um, along the border. And they were very upset. There were tense discussions with that administration. So, and I, and I, and I was also the bureau chief for, for the last year of of the Bush administration, where by the time I came in, they really didn't even talk to the New York Times and most of the press. So this is, I mean, people, this is, I'm comfortable with that relationship. I'm comfortable with, with the press having, I don't, I don't want to say antagonistic, because that's not the role, but a tense relationship with government, because our jobs are fundamentally different, and they're actually built to be at odds. They're supposed to be at odds. David, can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> the Obama administration? Yeah, I, I, was, I was gonna follow up on that, is that I, I get asked a lot, is, the, is it harder to get documents out of, out of the current government than it was under Obama and compared to Bush and all that? We are a really aggressive, aggressive pursuer of the Freedom of Information Act. We, I have filed 65 suits against the federal government. Uh, in my time here suing for the release of documents. And I have to say that one administration is pretty much indistinguishable from the other. They are terrible about the release of, 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 of documents. The Democrats are somehow worse, though, because of their attitude, which is, well, we've, 
we have released what we can. You can trust us. This is all you need to know. So, you know, you could go, go follow. The Republican administrations many times, you know, they just are very honest with you. No, we're not going to release that. You're going to have to go to court and sue us before you get that. And, and there's no sanctimony about it. Uh, and uh, Obama came in and, and was, was banging the drum about transparency. And the fact was that it, the things didn't get better. We spent a real long time uh, pursuing into the Second Circuit Court of Appeals here in New York uh, what we thought was, was a document that should be an obvious public document, and that is the legal basis that the government had for <clears throat> drone strikes away from the field of battle. They had uh, done drone strikes against an American citizen in Yemen, killed him uh, as a terrorism suspect. And the question was not whether that was right or wrong, but what is the legal basis that allows you to go into a country and kill somebody? And the government fought us for three years on that before we finally won the release of most of that, uh, of that memo. And uh, it just seemed as if that would be one of those things that the government would want to share with the public so the public can understand they actually had thought about it. And, and, and second, so the public could engage in that debate about what should be the law on this? What should be the way we approach the, the, this particular problem? I think, I think if, I can, if I can tell David's yeah. book, <laughs> one of the things that David um, crystallizes in his book, and, and I don't think it's much, it's much understood by people, is how much September 11th transformed the world of the press, government, and secrecy. I, I, just, I, I think it's hard to, I mean, first off, after September 11th, much of American military strategy was conducted in secret. The days when, when you sort of knew what, what there were going to be bombing campaigns or you knew where there were going to be troops on the ground, the combination of America believing so fiercely after September 11th that there was a, that there was a, a, a threat out there that wasn't attached to a government and, and the fervor that the country felt with the Patriot Act, et cetera, which meant that the government felt powerfully that it had to be, at, and, and mixed with the technology of drones, suddenly so much was done in secret. And so many decisions were made in secret. It extended through you know, two, three administrations now. And our, our jobs changed significantly because our jobs were to find out, I mean, think of it, the CIA actually ran a secret war that everybody knew about in Pakistan, in the tribal areas. That's, that's astonishing. And our job was to cover that. And the government was in, was in its most secretive mode. And it, it, it heightened the tensions. And I think that's one of the fundamental changes in the relationship between the press and the government. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of pressure to get on board after 9-11. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, I, I talk about how on, on September 10th, I was at a hearing involving uh, two kids. I was at the Daily News at that point. We were covering the story of two kids, or a group of kids who were charged with setting a homeless man on fire. And uh, the, the court couldn't make up its mind whether the, that should be open to the public. And then 9-11 came, and I never saw those people again. But um, it so fundamentally changed how things were going from that point <clears throat> forward. And so one of the things that got me my job at the New York Times was that a group of reporters here wanted to sue the city of New York, wanted to sue the fire department to find out, find the documents about what really happened in the rescue and recovery missions. Because the truth was there was an incredible amount of heroism, but there was a lot of mismanagement and a lot of people who died unnecessarily. We wanted to get at that story. And I have to say that um, at the times, there was some reluctance to bring that, to do that, to sue those heroes, to sue after everything New York had been, where we really, did we really want to sue the city of New York, sue the fire department, and be it an adversary to them when they had done such heroic things and people were, were suffering and, and grieving. And so when I came for my interview at the New York Times, it was, would you be willing to bring this suit? I was from the Daily News. I didn't know any better. We were constantly after the city. <laughs> you know, we were at war with the city. What was the point? Of course we would sue the city. Um, and, and that helped me get the job. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, one thing that I would like to, uh, David's, uh, because David is a gifted uh, lawyer and colleague, his job tends to expand in ways that um, are a little bit unexpected. And in the post 9-11 world, part of what became uh, part of David's brief <coughs> was security and um, threats against our journalists around the world. And there's one story I was hoping you could tell um, one of our reporters, a guy by the name of David Rode, who's now at The New Yorker, uh, was reporting in Afghanistan, I think it was 2008, 2008. 2008, yeah. And um, one thing that uh, reporters in, in dangerous zones do is if they go out reporting, they have scheduled call-ins with their bureau so that the person in the bureau knows that they're safe. David Rode uh, was going out to meet with a Taliban uh, commander and he missed one of those call-ins. And it turned out that the Taliban kidnapped him, his interpreter, and his driver. And suddenly, uh, you are in charge of our response to the situation. What did you do? I'm glad David never knew I was in charge, because no matter how terrified he was <laughs> of the Taliban, he would have been much uh, more scared to find out that I was the guy. Um, yeah, I get a call from the newsroom uh, that where an editor calls me and says, Did, didn't you write the crisis management plan, which was a kind of a classic bureaucratic thing I had done. I'd headed a committee. We'd written a crisis management plan. We would put it in a drawer, and it had sat there for, for three years. And now I get this call that somebody's been kidnapped. So I go down and uh, to, to meet with the editors and find out, just as Carolyn said, that, that David Rode had been kidnapped along with his two Afghan colleagues. And Nobody really knows what to do, and I knew we had consultants we could call, but nobody had ever called them before. And then someone had this incredibly good idea, I thought. They, someone pointed out that David Rode was writing a book, and maybe I should call the book publisher. So I stepped out of the room. I got the number of the general counsel at the book publisher. I called over, got the general counsel on the line. I said, you know, uh, David Rode was writing a, a, a book for you. He's working for us. He's been kidnapped in Afghanistan. I thought you should know. And the general counsel said, oh, I'm so glad you're involved. We wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 only, the, the bookend to that piece, though, is that um, David ultimately escapes. Seven months later, he escapes. I mean, if the, for, just to interject, yeah. those of you who don't know, this is one of those, like, don't try it at home. But they, they, were, kidna they were held captive for seven months. And I, they were starting to despair. And the way that they, they decide to escape, to plot an escape, so they tire, they tire out the hostage keepers by playing successive games of checkers against them until they're so fatigued. And then they sneak out in the night with a rope and uh, jump down from a 10-foot wall. And I think one of them gets injured yeah. and escape and end up at a Pakistani Right, at a military base, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which, and the military base had historically not been particularly secure, that it was an outpost. And there was great fear that they would turn them back to the Taliban if the Taliban came. So it was important that we move quickly. Uh, David um, uh, managed to make a phone call from the base. Um, I was in a car going, up, uh, going to a dinner party seven o'clock at night, and uh, David's wife, Kristen, calls me, who I'd become very close to over seven months, and, and she said that, you know, David has escaped, he called, my, he called my mother, and he needs help. And, you know, like, I reacted like a male, like a guy who's been kidnapped for seven months calls his mother-in-law, that struck me, <laughs> that really struck me, like, that guy must really be, okay. <laughs> It, it turned out that his, her mother was at home, and he had called home, and she'd pick up the phone. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but as I said- You never know what captivity right, right, well, you never know what it does to the mind. But so, uh, 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 Susan Shearer, our, our, our very, very talented uh, foreign editor, uh, and I then jump in a cab and head down to Christian's apartment so that we could all be in the same room while we try to figure out what to do. And on the, as, as Susan and I are going downtown, I managed on my cell phone to get hold of the embassy in, in Kabul. I explained the circumstances, you know, that David Rode has escaped, that he's at a military base, and that uh, he needs help. I forgot, I skipped the part about the mother-in-law. And, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning there, and this guy, I could hear him filling things out and you know, taking down notes and so forth. And then he says quite triumphantly, Mr. McCraw, 
you don't have to worry, we will do nothing to get in the way of your operation. <laughs> now, I'm a First Amendment lawyer. I'm in a taxi cab on the, on the west side of New York. I once wrote a crisis management problem, <laughs> plan. That is it, man. You are my operation. <laughs> you go find me an operation. Um, so uh, I just I, I wanted to bring us up to date now. Um, how worried are you both about threats against our journalists? What kind of uh, incoming do you get? Uh, are they physical threats? Are they online threats? Have you had to change uh, anything in recent years to deal with those realities? I, I worry a lot about threats, threats abroad in particular. I mean, I, w I was worried, to be frank, before the Trump administration. I mean, it's a more dangerous world to cover. Um, we are still at war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, whereas there's still places that we have to cover in Africa and elsewhere that are dangerous. I do think um, that that the, this administration's cavalier and even antagonistic attitude toward the press has made it worse. I think there was an under worse around the world. Yeah. Worse around worse worse around the world. I can talk about domestically, but to be frank, I worry more more around the world. I do think that that there there was a notion. Um, that the, that the American government, if a reporter really got in trouble, and I'm sure they would help if they got in trouble, um, but I think the notion that the, that the American government backs, it, backs journalists and backs the role of journalists and believes in the role of journalists in dangerous places, I'm not sure that this president has sent that signal. I think he sent the opposite signal. He's criticized the press on foreign soil. I don't mind the criticism, by the way. I mean, that's part of the... You know, he gets as much of, he has as much of a um, right to speak as we do. I, I mind these, the very powerful enemy of the people, um, the sort of conspiratorial portrait of the press and its effort to undermine his administration. I think, I think that's the stuff that makes life harder if you're abroad. We have had experiences where foreign governments have used the phrase fake news themselves. Um, and, and have, I, I, I think we're in a dangerous moment. And we've explained, I mean, our publisher has said that to him. David? Yeah, no, and, and I, I agree with all that, that they, uh, during the Bush administration, the State Department would actually <coughs> pay me to go out and talk about freedom of the press in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, the, the, the Middle East. It was part of what they saw as the gospel of freedom that they wanted to evangelize. And uh, they didn't really much like my newspaper, and they may not have liked me very much, but they thought that it was important for someone like me to go out and talk in developing democracies about these things. That's gone. And uh, I think that, as Dean's saying, that a lot of the worst governments in the worst places think that by persecuting their press, calling it fake news, passing fake news laws, there's one now uh, being uh, uh, passed in, in Singapore, that they actually are currying favor with the government. But I, I, I do want everybody to understand that we feel it here too. You see, as we come in the building right. now, barricades out there, which were not there before. We have to uh, make sure we have a 24 hour, seven day a week hotline for people to call because it's too easy on social media to threaten. And there's so much anger and so much partisanship. And <clears throat> most of those are not serious. Most of those people are not really threats, but we can't tell that <laughs> when we see the message. We don't know whether this is really the guy who's going to act upon it or not. Some of it is, is ham-handed and, and, uh, and sad. There was a guy who wrote an email to, uh, to a, one of our uh, editorial people in which he said that you know he had been walking by the New York Times and he was checking out the security because he wouldn't want anything to happen to anybody over there and it was this all this 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 sort of vaguely threatening thing and apparently he was so and as a writer I appreciate that he was so in love with his cleverness he forgot that he'd put his address and phone number on the bottom <laughs> which allowed me to find out where he worked which allowed me to email him at his work address, which allowed him to write a really not very creative email about how very, very sorry he was and he would never come near the New York Times again. Wow. But you just don't know that when you're getting these threats of just who's serious and who's not. Now I'd like to take you inside another uh, explosive story. Um, 
that again was started uh, by Dean Becquet and landed on David McCraw's desk. And that was the <coughs> extraordinary investigation exposing Harvey Weinstein's mistreatment of women, uh, including uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, Angelina Jolie, Ashley Judd, et cetera. Um, again, I think back in 2016, um, Dean Becquet decided to go at some allegations that were sort of still hanging out there about Bill O'Reilly. Can you tell us what happened from there? So when I was at the LA Times, um, I was managing editor and editor of the Los Angeles Times. I recall the case, and shows how the world has changed, in which a woman had sued Bill O'Reilly, um, claiming that he had, he had harassed her. And he went on the air and he attacked her. Um, and, and we were in a different era, because it was, you know, I guess it was 2006, 2005. And nobody quite followed up on it. So when the Roger Ailes stuff started to come out, I remember that case. <clears throat> and, I, and I was dying to know what happened to that woman. So I called in um, a couple of terrific reporters, Mike Schmidt, who's now in the Washington Bureau, and Emily Steele. And I asked them to find that woman and to, and to dig deep into what happened in that case. Because I even recalled somehow in the lawsuit, um, the lawsuit quoted something Bill O'Reilly had said. So I thought, there's a case file, there's a... And it took months and months, and they came back, and they came back, and O'Reilly and his lawyers kept writing me, saying they wanted to come in and, and talk off the record. I, I responded to them, I don't, we don't talk off the record to people who are the subjects of, of this kind of story. Um, and, and over several months, they came up with this pretty powerful story that, that ultimately cost O'Reilly his job. And after that, um, it was so blatant, but I thought, I thought they had figured out, I've been involved in stories like this before. When I was at the LA Times, we did an investigative story about Arnold Schwarzenegger um, right. groping women. But I thought Emily and Mike had discovered a, a new reporting angle, which was to look for settlements. Suddenly, it went, these stories went from, I'm sure lawyers understood this before, but suddenly it, these stories became possible. They weren't just, um, 10 anonymous sources. And they found these amazing settlements that added up to over $20 million in the case of O'Reilly. <clears throat> so I, we all sat down and said, this cannot be an anomaly. There must be other people like this. And they went out and they came back with um, these amazing allegations involving Harvey Weinstein. Now, uh, David, um, <clears throat> many journalists had taken um, tried to pursue this story in the past. Uh, I think The Hollywood Reporter, I think The New Yorker, I think. New York Magazine. New York Magazine, uh, NBC ended up sort of taking a pass at it um, with Ronan Farrow. Uh, tell us a little bit <coughs> about when we start going after Harvey, what the legal team was like and what the pushback was like. Okay. So um, it, it, uh, my initiation had been, of course, with, with, with the O'Reilly story and O'Reilly's attorney was everything Bill is not. He was quiet and measured and, and reasonable, rational. Um, and, uh, but he would come and, we, and, and he would talk about how there's no story there and explain this, that, and the other thing. Um, and, but as Dean was saying, the reporting that, that, that uh, Emily Steele and, and Mike Schmidt had done was was just impeccable, so that was the backdrop, and and it begins it and it sort of continues in the backdrop with with the Harvey Weinstein story, and um, when I'm f I'm called very early by by Jody Cantor uh, that she's going to be pursuing this and that that Megan Tui is going to be working on it too, and that you know I needed to be aware of it. One of the things, for those of you who've read the book, know is that the book is a testament to unfounded optimism. I always think everything is going to be okay. It's never okay. okay? <laughs> and this I is thought, why we love it. Right. So I, I, my sense was that this would be a he said, she said, that the Weinsteins would be unhappy. They may pull a few ads for a while. They'd be back, and everybody would play on. I had no sense that of, of what it was going to do uh, in terms of, of the cultural change that, that it, it, it set loose. And uh, unlike uh, Bill O'Reilly's legal team, you had a very aggressive approach from, from the, uh, the Weinsteins and they, uh, from Weinstein's team, and a variety of lawyers, uh, a political lawyer, a, a lawyer who was mainly known for representing women, uh, 
David Boies, the famous litigator, some big uh, Washington firm was also in the mix, ultimately Charles Harder, who um, uh, is, is well known as, as a uh, libel plaintiff's lawyer gets in, involved. It is, it is quite a team. And uh, we start getting these uh, the, uh, threatening letters and we start getting phone calls about it. One of the things I remember is that we're all meeting uh, in Dean's office and the issue has become whether Harvey Weinstein needs more than 48 hours to respond. And he, Harvey himself, had said, I'll get back to you in 48 hours. And then his lawyers jumped in and said they needed two weeks. And it, I wondered what he needed two weeks to do. Like, you know, it wasn't like we were asking him about some arcane accounting problem from some movie, you know, where you need to look at the books. Do you remember being with these women or not? You know, Harvey, it must have been in your memory someplace. And 48 hours was enough time to check that. So, um, uh, <laughs> so he, uh, uh, and, and, the, the interesting thing was that, of course, that, this, that his team fell apart almost immediately afterwards. That, right. that they were very quick to start abandoning ship and <clears throat> contradicting each other. Uh, and as I talk about in the book, uh, you know, we are you know, attempting to stay on top of what, what the stories we were doing. And meanwhile, in the background, his own lawyers are starting to question his truthfulness, question whether he has actually done it or not. And it becomes pretty obvious that that story is gonna go away. But in, the, in the, uh, the fallout from that is we started doing a lot of stories about a lot of uh, different incidents in a variety of, of industries, <clears throat> the arts, music, Wall Street, and so forth. And, and there became sort of this constant stream of people calling me lawyers representing somebody who is about to be the subject of a story. And they almost always said the same thing. And O'Reilly's lawyer said it to me too at one point, he's not Harvey Weinstein. Okay. That was the standard. Right, right, that became the standard, okay. Like you, you, know, you had to be, you know, in some people's minds, you had to be worse than Harvey, which by the way, takes some doing to, to actually get in the New York Times. And I tried to explain to them that the world had shifted whether they saw that or not. You know, there was, a, if I can say one, one, one thing, because because I just remembered it as you said this. I didn't think um, the Harvey Weinstein story would have the impact it had on the on the national conversation. In fact, we, we learned just like a couple weeks before we published that the New Yorker was working on the same story. <clears throat> and I called the reporters and their editor in and I said, we have got to do this story much faster. And they said, and I didn't understand it at the time, they said, we really need movie stars to help elevate the story. And I thought, oh, I, don't, I don't get it. And they kept pushing. Um, and then there was a moment, just this dramatic moment, as I recall it, the reporters may recall it differently. I was, I was wrong. I was pushing them. And then we were close to publishing like two nights before. Um, Jody walks in in tears. Jody Cantor. Jody Cantor, and she had just gotten off the phone with Ashley Judd, who had agreed to go on the record. We had a lot of stars who described their encounters with Harvey Weinstein, but she was the first one to go on the record, and that that transformed the story, because then others went on the record. And I don't, I think what I what I didn't quite understand is that it made the story more relatable to people, because they were people they recognized. And, and in fact, we, we, we made sure to do stories that were not about famous people. The next story we assigned was to go inside a Ford motor plant in, in near Chicago just to, but I think that the fact that these were celebrities, for better or worse, riveted people who had ignored stories like that before, and the reporters were right. And I, I, I'm, I'm stunned now that, it, that, that the conversation that followed those That's stories. Fascinating. And, and one of the things I should say here, because it, it goes to the heart of everything we've talked about, is that, and uh, <clears throat> Arthur deserves a lot of credit for this as well, during my time here and now with his son A.G. as publisher, that there's never been a discussion of we shouldn't do this. That was my next okay. Harvey Weinstein was one of our biggest advertisers. Right, he's a big, and, and nobody Emphasis thought. Emphasis on was. Yeah. Right, right, yes. right, right. Yes. No, no, you're right, right, was. Right, right. But he was when we were working on the stories. <laughs> right, right, right. And that, that, that didn't even come up. Uh, you know, there was not a conversation? No, no, no. Uh, uh, you know, my job is to get things into the paper and onto the web. 
Dean knows that, that, that I look at the world that way. And that makes all of this much easier because it's really about preparing. If somebody wants to sue us, they can sue us. We want to make sure we're prepared for that. Um, but it, we're, it, the, the, the funny thing, of course, is the difference in our style um, because, as I point out in the book, Donald Trump gave an interview with, with Tim O'Brien, used to be an editor here now at, at Bloomberg, uh, in which he talked about my, bedroom, about my bedside manner, about that, I was, that, that he was said that his, his lawyer had really been lulled into complacency because I had this great <laughs> bedside manner, which I, I think more that I'm, I'm some sort of sleep uh, uh, sleeping pill or something, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's bedside manner. But anyway, and and Dean, on the other hand, I, I happened to be in the room when one of Harvey's lawyers called, and Dean hung up on him, you know, which which is not part of my Midwestern <laughs> game plan, you know, <laughs> dealing with lawyers, uh, and and so. It was, I was put in the enviable position of being the good cop rather than the bad cop. But the lawyers thought they could at least talk to me. Um, I, we're going to get to your questions uh, really soon. Uh, but um, I, I do want to pause a little bit and just, you've both um, committed or devoted yourself to this industry for a long time. In fact, I think we have an image um, of a young David at the Quad City Times. Is that Whoa. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. Uh, Whoa. Oh man! <laughs> hey, wait, wait. There's got to be. There's got to be a lawsuit here, right? This cannot be legal. <laughs> that is the greatest <laughs> testament to age. Well, let's show it. I think we have uh, image number two. No. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so uh, we'll be talking to legal counsel. <laughs> we'll share costs on this. Um, so just a couple of things. You started out at the Quad City Times, which is in Davenport, Iowa. Correct. I think the motto of Davenport, Iowa is Iowa's front porch which made me really uh, curious about the back porch. But, uh, <laughs> so, and we looked up a little bit of your biography. It said that you, your, your ambition was to write editorials back then. Um, and Dean, um, I think in, that, in the picture that we showed, can we show that again? Can we yes, show yes, that? please. <laughs> Permanently. No. <laughs> Forever and ever. Uh, he's 22 in that photo. You should know, are there any millennials here? Dean, uh, can make you feel bad about what you've accomplished in life if you're looking for that tonight. At 31, uh, he won his first Pulitzer uh, in Chicago, uh, rooting out corruption uh, for, at the Chicago Tribune. And under the New York Times, under his leadership, we've won 14. Um, Dean, by the way. Thank you. <clears throat> now we can take the picture. <laughs> <laughs> So I just wanted, I wanted to ask you both, um, as you said, you've seen successive pres presidential administrations. You've seen social change. Um, you're both obviously devoted uh, to the First Amendment, to the freedom of the press. How op optimistic or pessimistic are you now? Well, as I said, my book is, is a testament to unfounded optimism. So I'm going to tell you it's going to be OK. okay? <laughs> um, I, I think that there is some damage that has been done and that's going to last for, for a while. I think that the, the vilification of the press uh, played, and I think there probably are other would-be presidential candidates and office holders uh, who think that that's going to be a winning strategy, so we're probably going to hear more about that going forward. There was a poll last year while I was writing my book that said that 26% of the people thought the president should have the power to close down news organizations that misbehave. Uh, things have gone far afield from the founders' uh, original vision when we get there. So um, I think that I, I am a little optimistic, but I think we got a lot of work to do. One of the things I have in my job, which is a very necessary component, is I have an incredible nut job radar. I can look at my email and tell <laughs> which, which ones are from people who I really probably don't want to hear from. And so I, I, my radar went off the other day, I saw, because I could tell the first line of the email was, why did you write this book? <laughs> so I, I didn't have the fortitude to read it that day, so I decided I would take it up in the morning. And it turned out it wasn't a nutter. It was actually someone who had a, 
it really he was sends, a friend? It, uh, yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> From my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, but, if it, but it was from a woman who made a really sensible point. It said, why, why did you write this book? You should be writing for young adults. That that's, that's the audience we that's should be smart. going after. We should be getting yeah. people on board earlier and often. And, and she was right. So I, I have a <clears throat> maybe a minority view. I think journalism is significantly better today than it ever was. Um, <clears throat> so I I grew up in New Orleans in in the you know 1950s and 1960s, <clears throat> where you I only had access to two local newspapers, which at the time were not very good. It's much better now. We're not very good, and three local television stations. If I wanted to read a paper of the quality of the New York Times or the Washington Post, I had to go to the public library and it was a week late. That same kid can now decide to read The Guardian. That same kid, if he speaks another language, can, can find some journalism um, in, his, in his language or her language. I think we're in a really difficult moment. I think local journalism is under tremendous threat. But the fact that people have so much, I mean, the New York Times in the print era never had more than a million, a million and a half readers. It's now got tens of millions of readers. We can do video, we can do motion graphics. Tr tr technology has made us all closer and has made journalism better for all of the bad stuff. And I think that, I think history is gonna portray this as a golden age, it is. So we're going to turn to your questions now. Uh, we have a few uh, requests. One is um, no statements, no speechifying, and um, actually no slam poetry. That has actually happened. <laughs> so um, the mics are set up on either side, if you can approach the mics. Uh, and uh, we just ask that you keep it brief and to the point. Yes? Well, I'm curious how you balance the problem of both sidesism. Um, it just seems to me that it's under attack and there's this belief that you have to show a balanced point of view. How do you manage that? How, what determines that? See, I never, I, th I think that, I think that, um, that notion has been made almost comical. I don't think, I'm not sure both siderism is the, is the right approach and it's not the approach I believe in. I don't, I think that's become sort of a stalking horse for fairness. Mm -hmm. Fairness means fairness and open-mindedness and a sense of inquiry. That to me is journalism. It, that does not mean if you, th we, we do not go out to make sure we quote 25 people that say there's no, man did not contribute to the changing climate. That would be ridiculous. That's not what most people believe. There's a debate, the only debate is what should be done about it. I, I don't believe in that. I believe in open-mindedness, open-minded inquiry. I don't, I don't, I never believed in both siderism. I think, I think some of our critics, and, and some, I, I always assume some of it's our fault, right? You have to have a little bit of humility in this business. <clears throat> I think that, I think that probably in lazy moments of trying to be, to make sure you're capturing the whole of the story, journalists have gone too far and just sort of, you know, including the quote, other side. But I think that some things don't have other sides, some things do. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes readers get upset when they read something that they disagree with and they mm -hmm. think that that's a, an attempt at getting at both siderism, when really what it's an attempt to surface ideas for debate and discussion, which to me is journalism. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Could you talk, whoever feels most comfortable talking about it, but could you discuss a little bit your experience working with James Risen to just, to, I guess it would be defend him against the sure Holder Justice Department's uh, subpoenas to get him to testify against uh, Jeffrey Sterling, and more broadly about the Obama administration's prosecution of journalists? Yeah, um, so, the, the subpoena actually starts under the Bush administration, carries over into the into the Obama administration. Uh, Jim wrote a book uh, which included a chapter about the efforts of the U.S. government to sabotage the Iranian nuclear facilities. It was built to some extent on classified information. A former CIA 
employee agent by the name of Jeffrey Sterling was prosecuted um, uh, for leaking information, and Jim was called as a uh, uh, was subpoenaed to testify whether Jeffrey Sterling was or was not his source. Uh, none of that reporting appeared in the New York Times. It was from his book. But Jim made a principled and important stand, which was he would not testify uh, in response to that subpoena. And uh, ultimately, the case goes on for years, as you know. And the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals issues a very, very damaging opinion, which essentially says that in a grand jury investigation, at least in a leak investigation, there is no right to, uh, on the part of the reporter to protect his source. Uh, that was a, is a damaging, damaging decision. The case goes back to trial, and Jim says, I'm still not going to say who my source was. At that point, the government walked away from the subpoena, and Jeffrey Sterling today is in prison because they were able to make that case without Jim's testimony. So the net-net result on all that was that they, the prosecutors, by pursuing Jim, end up creating very bad law for the rest of us. And the whole case was built on something that was untrue. He was not necessary to do that, the, uh, to, 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 to make that case. The point I would make, the larger point I would make, is that almost all leak investigations are not about, are not about protecting national security. Almost all leak investigations are trying to silence critical reporting, and that is why we need the law to protect reporters who have confidential sources. Yes, sir. Um, don't you think we should take a harder look at the proposition that uh, President Trump is entitled to the First Amendment freedom as anybody else? Any government official who uses their government position to put out lies and falsehoods <clears throat> is not uh, is basically engaging in state-sponsored state propaganda. Um, and uh, it seems to me that he should be challenged on that proposition if he lies or puts out, uh, or puts out information that is completely opposite to the truth. And it seems to me the New York Times is in a perfect standing position to bring a lawsuit to say, as a government official, whatever he wants to say on a campaign trail is one thing. As a government official, he cannot use the term fake news without proving that it is fake. I think that the, uh, my view on this is, is pretty straightforward, and that is that the, the main mission of the New York Times should be to commit journalism, not to be litigating, that uh, I certainly appreciate the, the <coughs> sentiment. The best thing I think we can do is not sue or bring legal challenges, but to report that out. And I hope that that story <clears throat> resonates with people. Um, I, I am at heart a libertarian. I believe that the problem of fake speech, the problem of lies, the problem of hate speech, all of that is best addressed, if we can, by more speech. And uh, I would hope that that would be the position the New York Times would take. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, you mentioned... You mentioned September 11th, and I want to bring up the run-up to the Iraq War and Afghanistan. Would you agree with the statement that the media completely dropped the ball in holding the Bush administration accountable for their truths? And would you take response? I mean, I know that you, you came in at a different time, but <coughs> would, could you talk about that, please? Yeah, I think I, I, I will say m most or much of the media because I think there were some publications that didn't. Yeah, I think much of the media, <clears throat> and I, won't, I wasn't at the New York Times, so I won't speak for the New York Times, but, but I, was, I was at the LA Times. I think much of the media did not ask hard enough questions in the lead up to the, to the Iraq war. I, th I think anybody who would deny that is kidding themselves. I think, it w I think the combination of, you know, I mean, journalists are human beings, and they make mistakes. I think the combination of the certainty of the Bush administration, um, along with the fact that I think there was some, some, some journalists are a little bit in awe of power. I think that's changed, by the way. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think we ask hard enough questions. Of course, I would. I would not deny that. I would agree with it. The reason I said much is because I think if you you could find publications, not so much in the mainstream press, but you could find publications that ask hard questions. I, I have in my mind a, a cover, and I can't remember if it was The Nation or Mother Jones, but it's that kind of publication that's that's powerfully on the left. You know, I, I have just have in my mind a cover that said it's not too late. Um, but I, sure, I would agree with that, and I've said that before. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, hi, this question is for, uh, um, for David. Um, just wondering if you could um, um, just share any advice that you might have um, for law students or, or lawyers early in their career who are thinking of you know, pursuing a career um, similar to the one you've had. I think we're out of time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, I, I get asked this question a lot, so I'm always happy to, to answer it. And um, I, I had a very unusual career, as I tell my law students at, at NYU and at Harvard. Uh, I was actually sent to law school. You don't have that excuse. You volunteered for this. Uh, I, I, I was a college professor in upstate New York. Uh, the dean at my college thought I needed an advanced degree, and we agreed that I would go to law school. I went to law school. I was 34 years old. I had a six-month-old. Uh, I thought that law school was a great thing. It was a great time to be a student. When you're 34, you realize the real world isn't all it's cracked up to be, so you're happy to go back into the womb of, of higher <laughs> education. Um, so. Uh, to me, the, the things that, that really mattered, were, have really mattered and made a difference is that uh, hard work, that uh, it, it solves a lot of problems. You may not be the brightest person in your class, you may not be the <coughs> brightest person in your law firm or at, at, at your company, that, but hard work solves a lot of problems. I found that being curious was, was always a really, really good thing as, as a lawyer. Um, I spent a whole lot of time as an associate at a law firm in New York litigating a sugar delivery in Santos, Brazil. I can bore you for a really <laughs> long time about how sugar is delivered in Santos, Brazil, uh, <clears throat> which is not really that interesting, but curiosity helps. Um, and I, I think believing in yourself matters, so that, that it has is, is made a difference. Uh, that's how I got from that picture. Don't ever show that again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, as far as like specific things, uh, the, the world of media has changed. If you're interested in media law, I think you now need to know intellectual property. I think you now need to know the internet. And I, and I think you need to understand how international law works because all of that has become the reality of the practice of law. All right, I think that's a, oh, do you have a question? Sure, come, come forward. This will be our last question. And remember, David will be out in the lobby uh, signing books after. And he'll be signing that picture, too, <laughs> for an extra yeah. charge, slightly extra charge. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, can, I think I can make the assumption that um, this audience is, a, uh, there's a like-mindedness here, and that when we talk about fake news, um, that this audience probably positions themselves on the, the side of truth, okay? We've been talking a lot today about speaking truth to power, okay? And the idea that um, your role is to protect the times um, when it does speak truth to power. But I'd like to hear you speak a little bit about the idea of uh, speaking truth in the face of the powerlessness. There's an artist named Alexander Bell who has taken on the New York Times for some of its editorial surrounding um, social justice and cases that take on race relations and the way that perhaps the, um, the viewpoint of the journalist uh, might position um, the victim as a perpetrator. And I'm just sort of interested is, when do you get involved when there isn't someone powerful there who may sue the paper um, to ensure that the truth and the facts come through without a bias? I know, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the case. I, I, I'm, I'm talking in, in, in general. Um, okay. there, uh, and I could give you some examples, but I probably would misquote them. But <coughs> just in general, sure. because Harvey Weinstein has, has you know, lawyers, whereas. Yeah, I, I actually think that's a, I actually think that's a very, that's a very wise question. Um, because in fact, one of, one of the things that, that I want to make sure we do and understand 
is that some of the people we cover and write about are not powerful. And I want to make sure that, the, that my newsroom is filled with people of different backgrounds, um, filled with people who, who are empathetic, not sympathetic, I like the word empathetic better, who are empathetic toward people who don't have power, maybe people who have backgrounds that, that um, including mine and probably David's, where we did not grow up with power. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I want a newsroom that understands that much of America, not only our readers, but the people who can't afford to read us, may not have much power and that part of my job and part of my mission is to speak to them just as much as, as anybody else. That seems like a great uh, question on which to end. Um, again, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you to David. Thank you. That was a great picture. <laughs>